you know, when we talk about leadership, how complex, what makes leadership so complex? It's pretty easy to say, well, 2020 is an easy answer, right? It's much more than that. When you look at the complexity of leadership, really it comes down to three things. It comes down to people, it comes down to the situation, and also leadership ambiguity. You know, when you talk about people, as a leader, your subordinates and the people that you work with, your peers, they all have different needs. As a leader, you have to understand that. You have to understand their needs, their personal needs, their professional needs. Also, we have a very diverse workforce. Leaders are going to be confronted with different viewpoints. And that is not something that you should push away, but something you should embrace. We're a lot smarter together than we are alone. And so the diversity that we have in the uh, workforce today is something that gives us actual strength and also vision and dignity as a leader. You've got to communicate your vision. You've got to be able to instill that initiative. You've got to be able to instill a great culture. You've got to be able to instill high morale within your organization. And then when we talk about situations, look at the situation that public safety is operating in today. Again, it's, it's easy to look at it and feel defeated, but it's really an opportunity there. And when you look at the situations that leaders are confronted with, it also makes leadership very complex because the situations are quickly evolving. Um, it's the complexity of the situation. You're dealing with the community. You're dealing with the men and women who work in your organization. You're dealing with the political structure. You're dealing with your boss, whoever that may be. It may be someone within the organization. It may be the city manager. It may be the county manager. And also there's limited alternatives to reach resolution or to find a solution. It's not what I wished I had, but what you do have. And you've got to find that in the resources available, and you've got to find it in the people that you have, their strengths. And also, when I talk about leadership and dignity, <laughs> what type of leader are you? You can call yourself a servant leader all day. You can, you can consider yourself a transformational leader, a situational leader. Well, it doesn't matter what type of leader you think you are. What type of leader does your subordinates think you are? That's what matters, is what they think. You think you're a great leader. Okay, you may be. What does your subordinates think of your leadership style? You know, so many times we equate leadership with rank. I'm a sergeant, I'm a lieutenant, I'm a major, I'm a deputy chief, I'm a chief. That rank doesn't make you a great leader. It just gives you more authority and more responsibility. It's just like the uniform you wear. All it is is a piece of cloth. The badge you wear is a piece of metal. What gives meaning to that uniform and that badge is you, the person wearing it. What you stand for, what you do on a daily basis. You know, and also when we talk about leadership and dignity, when you get promoted, we're not promoting leaders. In public safety, most of the time, individuals are promoted. They take a test, they go to an assessment center. You're promoting a person that made a good score. That's what you're promoting. It is up to that person to become a great leader or to continue to be a great leader. And it's up to the organization to set that person up in a leadership role. And also, when we talk about leadership, and we say it's a four-letter word, I'm not talking about lead. I'm talking about care. As a leader, that's the most important four-letter word that you can have, is care. Your people and your community has to believe that you actually care. Think about who your mentors are. Think about who you go and talk to when you have a problem. Think about who you seek out when you want answers to questions that is heavy on your heart. 
Is it people you don't trust? Is it people that don't care? Or you believe they don't care? No. It's the individuals that you believe care about you, care about the mission, care about the organization, and care about people. If a leader is not perceived to care, that leader's never going to be effective. Think about that. Do you want to be led by a person that you don't believe cares? I don't. I'm sure you don't either. But when you look at the word care and we break it down even farther, you know, further, and we turn it into an acronym, C, communication, A, acceptance, R, respect, E, two words, empathy and elevate. A leader's got to communicate, they've got to accept, they've got to respect, and they've got to practice empathy, and they've got to elevate their subordinates. And so, when I was thinking about what to say today, I thought about those four things, communication, acceptance, respect, empathy, and elevate. And what I wanted to do is to kind of give you a snapshot of great leaders that I believe I've had the privilege and the honor of knowing throughout the years that have taught me lifelong lessons that when I met them I was one person and after I was lucky enough to meet them and spend some time with them and to observe them and what a great leader they were I was not the same person. They they actually had a lot of impact in my life and they gave my life better meaning and I think they made me a better leader. You know, when we talk about communication, when you get right down to it, communication does four things. It informs, of course. It informs up. It informs down. Communication clarifies. Also, communication, it creates inclusiveness. There's no one in here that doesn't want to know what your organization is doing. And the only way to learn that organization is for your leadership to practice good communication. But the one thing that we forget that communication does is it gathers the ground truth. And in order to do that, we have to understand that part of communication is listening. So yes, I'll tell you a story. You know, when I left Cobb County, the first time back in 2005, I was lucky enough to become a member of an organization, uh, Department of Defense, the Joint ID Field Organization, JIDO. JIDO is a tremendous organization, and if I look back at my life, I will always believe that being a part of that organization was, was one of the uh, highlights of my career. Now, JIDO came about because of the IED problem. We had combat operations in Afghanistan, and then in March of 2003, we invaded Iraq. And soon after, just several days after the invasion of Iraq, was the first suicide bomber. And then, of course, the use of the IED and suicide bombing incidents escalated tremendously. And it was in the IED was one of the greatest killers of our troops at that time. Matter of fact, by October 2007, we were having uh, approximately 3,000 IED events per month. And so there was a task force. It was called the IED Task Force, and it was ran by General Bertel. And again, the IED situation continued to escalate, and so the DOD stood up JIDO as an organization. Montgomery Miggs was a retired four-star. What a great man. I learned so much from him. Montgomery Miggs, uh, born in 1945. His father was a tank commander, a colonel in World War II. His father was killed one month before Montgomery was uh, born. He never got to meet his father. But the Miggs had a great military tradition. Matter of fact, Montgomery was named after his great, great, great uncle, who is known as the architect of Arlington Cemetery. Also, General Miggs retired 
was a doctorate, PhD. Man, very smart guy. But the thing that I learned from him was, don't talk so much. Listen. Listen to the person on the ground. I remember myself and a guy named Zoltan Proke. We were going to Iraq and we were going to do an assessment of Task Force 134, General Stone's Task Force, detainee ops and interrogations. And we were going to compare that to what the Marines were doing out in the West, their joint prosecution uh, exploitation cell. And I was sitting in the office, I was preparing to leave in a few days, and I saw a shadow came in, I looked up, this General Mix. And he and I had met him a few times, and he 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 remembered my name, he remembers everyone's name. He said, Mike, what you doing? I said, sir, and I told him I'm getting ready to go over. And General Meigs sat down, and for the next two hours, he helped me plan that mission. He asked critical questions, but he he listened a lot. And he said, Hey, when you're when you're back in three or four months, I want you to come see me. A few days before Zotan and I came back, his aide reached out and said, hey, remember, the general wants to see you and he's expecting a brief. He didn't forget. And the reason he didn't forget is because he felt that the most important information that a leader can have is from the man on the ground. And you never second guess the man on the ground. That's why leaders have to have that decentralized decision making. You can't sit miles away and try to dictate what the person is actually facing on the ground at that particular time. And I learned that from General Meigs. Matter of fact, when he retired, one of the things he said at his retirement ceremony was, hey, very honored that I was part of this organization and I helped to build it. But this organization was built on knowledge, but more so than that, it was built on communication listening to the man on the ground. And when we talk about acceptance, you know, we have to accept people, our limitations, our opportunities, and we have to accept the situation. You know, when you look at what's happening around us today, and you look at the news, it's, it's almost depressing to turn the news on. You know, you turn the TV on, it's like, man, can I just find something that I can just get away for a few minutes? But we look at that, you know, as a, a defeat, possibly, when it could be an opportunity. Everybody's been to Disney World, I would imagine. Walt Disney, he created Disney World, he and his brother, in 1928. What happened in 1929 that lasted until 1939? The Great Depression. So here he is starting this animation business up. Uh, and the Great Depression hits. I don't think he even knew there was a Great Depression because he looked at it as an opportunity. He said, America's going through a trying time. America's being tested. But even through the trying time and this great test, America needs to smile. And he uses animation to make Americans do that to break away, if nothing more than just a few moments, to look at a cartoon, to, to look at Mickey Mouse, to get their mind off what was happening. And so he turned that moment that could have been defeat, oh man, I just started this business and now the Great Depression, but he turned it into an opportunity. Also, when I think about acceptance, I think of a guy named Joe Walker. I would venture to say that probably no one in here has heard about Joe Walker unless you've read books about Vietnam, unless you've read books about special forces, unless you've read Plaster's book on SOG in Vietnam. You know, when I went to the 11 Special Forces Group, active duty uh, with the 7th Group, active duty liaisons were being assigned to the reserve units. I was with the 11 Special Forces Group. I was an 18 Charlie, uh, Special Forces Engineer and Demolitions guy at the time. And there was this guy, uh, very quiet. He came around, he talked to you every now and then, but 
he was real big on patrol, teaching us how to patrol. And so I, I started learning about Joe Walker. Joe Walker did five tours in Vietnam with Max Sog. He ran Recon Team California. The man was a legend, and here I am talking to him. And uh, I, even to this day, I, uh, I'm still in awe of, of him. But he, he taught me about the situation. And I think that that is a great uh, leadership understanding that we have to accept the situation as it is, not what we want it to be, not what we wished it would be, but what the situation is. And I remember every time that we would go out and we would do these controlling exercises and he would set up these situations, he would say, hey, he'd come over to the patrol leader and he'd say, what's your situation? And you'd have to tell him, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? You know, as leaders, we're faced with situations every day. They're quickly evolving, very complex. Um, but you know, as a leader, that's the question. I understand the situation, and the question is, what are you going to do about it? Because you don't have an alternative. You've got to do something about it. You've got to make a decision. And then as we go into um, respect, I think that everybody will agree that leaders want to be respected as leaders. But in order to be respected as a leader and to get respect, you've got to give respect. Again, I go back to Hank Kennison, retired colonel. Some of you guys from, uh, some of the people from Cobb County may know Colonel Kennison. He came and spoke at one of our holiday parties or a holiday get together. But what I learned from Colonel Kennison, and I worked for him also at the Pentagon, was respect. He respected everyone. And I remember one day, um, he gave me a call, and there was a young man that we were going to have to dismiss. I personally liked the young man, but the situation was such that he had to be dismissed. And I remember Hank calling me, and he was saying, I know it's hard to make that decision. He said, but always do one thing. When that young man leaves your office, let him leave with respect. Let him leave with his respect. And as leaders, you know, everybody talks about, you know, sometimes having to uh, maybe raise your voice uh, or give a good old-fashioned butt chew. You can do that, but you can do it respectfully. You can do it in a respectful way and get your point across. You're a leader. And then when we talk about empathy and we talk about, you know, elevation, hey, man, life happens. You know that. And as a leader, we have to understand that. The people that work below us, just like you in your life, they're going to lose their way. They're going to make mistakes. And I grant you that 99.9% .9 of the time, that it was unintentional. It was a mistake. And as leaders, we have to understand that and we have to do what's right by that person, by the organization, and by the community. But we do have to understand that sometimes the subordinates are gonna fall short and as a leader, that's when you can either have them maintain standing 10 inches tall or build them back up and have them again walk around 10 foot tall and also elevate and when I talk about elevation another guy comes to mind Major General Eldon Bargewell he did two tours in Vietnam as an NCO he went on to be the uh, commander of Delta Force and one thing that I can tell you about Eldon or General Bargewell and unfortunately he passed away uh, in 2019 but what I can tell you is that his sole purpose in life was not to see, not to sing his accolades, but to sing the accolades of his subordinates, to build them up. You know, one of his favorite sayings was, you shouldn't blow your own horn unless you're in a band. And uh, the guy had done so many things in his life, but again, just a humble guy. And I remember him telling me, Mike, everybody wants something. 
Everybody's trying to attain something. It can be something personal. It can be something professional. You, as a leader, have the ability to be that ladder to help them reach what they're trying to attain. And I remember that to this day. And uh, when I look at and I reflect back on Montgomery Biggs, I reflect back on Joe Walker, on Hank Kennison, and on Eldrin Bartwell, man, what great leaders to emulate, what great leaders to listen to and to absorb all you could from them. It made me a much better person. And you know, as we go forward, just like everyone in here, we're gonna get older and we're gonna leave the office for the last time one day. And there's two questions you need to ask yourself as a leader. When that day comes, can you truthfully ask, did the people I lead in the community I serve believe that I really care? And the second question that you should ask yourself is that I leave it better than I found it. And hopefully the question, the answer to both of those questions is yes. And if not, maybe you need to reevaluate re your leadership style. And what I want to do, I, I wanted to relinquish some of my time uh, to a young lady that is one of my executive vice presidents um, at Quiet Professionals out of Tampa. She traveled up to speak, um, Kashima Garcia. She is an Air Force veteran, and as stated, she's one of the executive vice presidents, and uh, she is over our human capital and strategies division. And she does a lot of work with uh, executives and culture. And I wanted to give her a five to 10 minutes to come up and say a few words to you, and I think you'll really enjoy what she has to say. And again, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak today, and it's an honor. Hey, God speed to all of you and hang in there. Uh, you do a great job, and without you, where would we be? Thank you.